namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye olahodi sammyao sanputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan sao yu. 我今见闻得受持，愿皆如来真实意。Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shri Pushangren, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. It is. Sunday, December 27th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. Saturday, December 26th, in California. We are about to look into the Flower Garland Sutra's tenth stage once again. We've uh, I noticed on our collection of YouTube videos of this series, we're now at number 52, I believe, or 53. So into our second, we're heading towards 100. Lectures to finish the ten stages chapter, and it might take that long. It might take a hundred. Why? Because the verses are coming, and the verses are、uh, there's a lot of them. This is the among the ten stages chapter. The of the ten separate stages, this tenth stage has probably the longest selection of verses. So,、um, what we're about to do is invoke spiritual presence. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Sutra,、uh, the Flower Garland Assembly. We're going to come back to page 62 when we're back, and I'm going to slide up. There we go. Slide up to the top here. There we are. And just before we get started, I'd like to express my gratitude on this holiday weekend to all of the volunteers who make this. Broadcast this webcast possible.、Um, if it was just me sitting here talking,、uh, maybe the the magpies would be amused briefly, right? And、uh, I'd be talking for the the gum trees here, but not for anybody else. But because folks are willing to put it into the ether, put it into the into the internet,、uh, translate it into Chinese, translate it into Vietnamese,、uh, so as a result.、Uh, People actually get to hear it and、uh, get to think about it and get to make it part of their lives. So that's a huge blessing, and I am grateful for that. Indeed, it is teamwork that makes this happen for sure.、Um, we are past the winter solstice, summer solstice here in Australia. We're past、uh, Christmas and. Past Hanukkah, Amitabha's birthday has come and gone. Diwali has come and gone. Kwanzaa, and we're heading towards the solar new year.、Um, the lunar uni- lu- lunar new year is yet ahead of us, but、uh, we'll meet that when we get there. Meanwhile. Weather sounds much better when it's tuned. Let's see here. Yes, indeed, that's what I thought. Got it. Found it first time. Please join me. We'll recite the Chinese. The lower part of the screen there, Namo Da Fang Guang Fu Hua Yan Jing Hua Yan Hai Hui Fu Pu Sa, and in our hearts we'll ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Dharma protectors, to invisibly.
draw near and to bless every one of us in this gathering. Namo That's the way to do it, yeah. Scroll on the sidebar and then click once. People's, save people's stomachs. There we go. Okay. We're in the last part of the prose section of the 10th stage, the tenth stage. And we're hearing about the bodhisattva's qualities, 10th stage bodhisattva, the awakened being, what are his abilities, what are his virtues, what are his newfound strengths after having qualified, having been anointed on the crown of the head uh, to become the, the next Buddha, uh, should he decide to go on, should she decide to go on. At this point, still in the 10th stage, there's still a difference between this bodhisattva and a Buddha in terms of knowledge, in terms of abilities, but not much, right? So that's been one of the questions we've talked about is what's the difference between this bodhisattva who's almost there and a Buddha? So it's a very, uh, very much like a school in that you go to class, you take the tests, you pass the exams, you certify, and you are a graduate, right? So Buddhas are graduates from the uh, training of the mind and this bodhisattva at this point is right there, right at that point, but uh, may not want to go ahead, may, may choose not to. Earth store bodhisattva, Kshitagarbha bodhisattva down in the hills chose to stay a 10th stage bodhisattva. If he uh, decided to become a Buddha and finish, his, he'd have to change his vows, right? His vows talk directly about that. He has two famous vows, he says, uh, until the hells are empty, I won't become a Buddha. Only after living beings are all crossed over will I realize Bodhi and purify my mind that last step. So he chooses, he chooses to stay in the hells as a 10th stage Bodhisattva because living beings are not about to, to, to end this weekend, right? So, here we are, and here's today. We're on page 62. We'll read this first section right there. I'll make it bigger so you can read it. There we go. Ready? Fu zuo shi nian, wo dang yu yi che zhong sheng wei shou, 
为圣，乃至为一切智智意之者。若亲家谨近与一念情，得十不可说，百千亿哪有他？佛刹微尘数三昧，乃至是现而所微尘数菩萨以为眷属。He further makes the following reflection: I should be a leader among all sentient beings. I should be supreme, up to and including being one with the wisdom of wisdoms upon whom others may rely. If this bodhisattva is diligent and vigorous within the space of a thought, he can realize samadhis, as many as the fine motes of dust in ten, indescribably many, hundreds of thousands. Of kotis of nayutas of Buddha lands, up to and including being able to make appear as many bodhisattvas as there are fine motes of dust as his following. This is called、uh, the refrain portion, the chorus, the boilerplate. Same description comes up in each of the ten stages, just less of each one. Um, it's a pattern that repeats and repeats at this phase of the chapter. So we、uh, we hear how each of the ten stages fits in to this mold, right? With the new addition of expanded quantities, mostly. So, for example, this bodhisattva says, "I should wo wei shou, yu yi che zhong zhang zhong wo wei shou." I'm going to be the the head. The show is ahead. The chief, the leader, among all living beings, and I should be Sheng, which is the winner, the victor.、Um, and then, in earlier,、uh, ground, earlier stages, way down, kind of like if you're a college grad now or a grad student grad, this is back down in elementary school, in terms of bodhisattva path. We got more specifics about what the bodhisattva said. I should become. I think they were at one. It might have been the second or third stage. He he listed ten. He I should be wei wei sheng wei shu sheng wei te bie shu sheng. You know I should be、uh, special. I should be really special. I should be exceptional and special.、Mm-hmm. Why is this? Is competitive? No. It's because. In order to do what a bodhisattva does, you have to keep yourself、uh, encouraged. You have to keep your enthusiasm up because, frankly, it's hard to always go last. <laughs> it's hard, to, as Master Hua would say, always take a loss, chukui, every time. It's always hard to. It's hard to always come out on the short end of the stick. And be okay with that, not not be upset about that, not worry. And bodhisattvas are famous for doing that, for taking a loss every time. Why? Because some perverse、uh, anti-winner, they wanted to like be the anti-Trump or something, and just refuse to 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 win. Not not that at all. It's that in order to do. To fit in with their priorities, they have to be sure to get others ahead of them. Their vows is is a short answer. Their vows say, "I will wait until others get there first, and then I go. Then it's my turn." It's not they don't want a turn. It's just their turn comes after everybody goes first. Their vows say, "We all get there together." And if I leave some out, we don't get there. So the bodhisattva, in order to accomplish his or her vows, goes last. That's why. So taking a loss, taking the short end of the deal, actually gets them where they want to be. So it's not perverse. It's not some reverse、uh, antinomian kind of antisocial psychology. It's not. It's not twisted. It's most people would say, "What a loser." Right? Who would dare do that? Well, the bodhisattva has different priorities. Okay, so that's that's what that's about. 
when he says, I should be supreme, I should be foremost, I should be the one whom others can rely upon to get them the wisdom of wisdoms. He's like that. This is the ultimate adult. Can wait. This bodhisattva can wait. He can defer gratification. Boy, oh boy. Really defer gratification. He gets the good stuff, but it's a big good stuff. It's not the quick fix. It's not the, sh the quick hit, right? The short game. The bodhisattva is playing a long game. Amazing, right? And yet, in the human heart, this capacity is there. Truly, truly. Too good to be true? Because it's true. Because it's, therefore it's good. Because it's good, therefore he does it. If this bodhisattva is diligent and vigorous, and we're assuming he is, within the space of a thought, ah, okay, Here's some avatamsaka measurements, which is what? Inyanqing. What is the space of a thought? Brief. We've, we've talked about this in lectures past, uh, how in, uh, in the Theravada tradition they have this study called the Abhidharma. And the Abhidharma is a very well-developed, uh, very uh, precise psychology based on observation. When I say psychology, that's not kind of uh, uh, pandering to before psychology was invented, sort of a whimsical, you know, uh, not. Indeed, meditators from the Buddhist time and before in the Hindu Brahmanist tradition, people have been watching their minds and reporting what they found for a very long time empirically, scientifically, with measurement, with literature, with tradition, with training, with observation, right? So the Abhidharma is that. It's the reports of men and women for many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years watching the application of a method, a dharma, on their minds and what happens. So, um, and, and that includes going into samadhi, coming out of samadhi, having, uh, having chan sickness, having things go wrong, uh, halfway home, and healing that, getting back on the right track, following a method, discarding a method, adopting a new method, all these different uh, experiments with the human mind and the dharma have, have become literature, right? So it's available, it's accessible. And it's taught this, this kind of uh, meditative psychology. So uh, in the Abhidharma, they talk about space of a thought, how many thoughts there are in the, in the, in the mind, you know, how, many, how many thoughts, how many brief thoughts. Uh, and then more interesting is when it became the Bodhisattva path, the Mahayana, developing above the Abhidharma, the, the Bodhisattva with a further refinement of the mind had to come up with finer and finer slices of this human experience called thought, right? So if this Bodhisattva is diligent and vigorous, and you know he is, within the space of a thought, that is to say in a very, very, very brief interval, he can realize samadhis. So the mind clicks into gear just the way a expensive sports car, well-tuned, clicks into gear. Press the clutch, maybe double clutch. Move the, the, the gear, shift, lever. You're in gear. Boom. And away you go. Right? Samadhi is the same. Your mind clicks into gear how many? Here comes an avatamsaka number. As many samadhis as, here, take a breath, ready? The fine motes of dust in 10 indescribably, words but fail, many hundreds of thousands, 
count the zeros, kotis of nayutas, Sanskrit numerals, of Buddha lands. That's a number. <laughs> count it up. Get your calculator. Punch, 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 punch. Get the tape, right? Oh, man. Let's try it again. How many fine motes of dust? Let's go backwards. Okay, Buddha lands. Think of a Buddha land. Buddha land is a continent. A Buddha land is a world. A Buddha land includes planets, but more. Okay, big, 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 big. Okay, take one Buddha land, but here we have 10 indescribably many hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas of Buddha lands. That's a lot of worlds. How many motes of dust are there in that many Buddha lands? Okay, that's how many samadhis this bodhisattva can gear into, mesh into smoothly, finally, in an instant of thought. Ten stage bodhisattva. I would say his mind, her mind, is tamed. There's not a lot of random impulses in this mind. There's not a lot of instinct, right? Just It was just instinctual, right? It's not a lot of passion that just, I don't know why I did that. It just kind of took me over. Uh-uh, not. This bodhisattva has chased the dust bunnies out, has swept up the debris, has you know, roto-tilled the ground, has added the amendments and nicely moistened the, if, if this bodhisattva's mind were a field, the topsoil would be this deep, right? There are wonderful uh, anthropological, where anthropology meets ecology, there are treatises written about civilization and topsoil, believe it or not. This would be, anybody there who's looking for a, like a major, you're looking for some place to devote your life, oh boy, uh, after you get out of school, go into agronomy, go into the study of crops or food for humans that doesn't harm. What is the measure of a civilization's flourishing or failure? How thick is their topsoil? How thick is the topsoil in a desert? How much food grows in the desert? None, right? Why did the settlers, in, when they landed in North America, thrive? Well, a lot of reasons. One is they massacred the indigenous residents, but they said that where I grew up in the, Ohio, the Lake Erie River, uh, Lake, Lake Erie bottomland of the Great Lakes, the topsoil was so thick that you take an apple seed, throw it in the air, it lands, wherever it lands, an apple tree grows. Is that hyperbole? Nah. The Great Plains of America, think Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, right? those states, the Ogallala Aquifer, this giant body of fresh water underlies those high plain states. The, the tilth, T-I-L-T-H, the, the thickness of the topsoil there was so deep that you could just grow, you know, soybeans, corn, alfalfa, wheat. Then came what? Then came the dust bowl and the topsoil blew away and so did the people. Couldn't grow anything. So, man oh man, if this bodhisattva's mind was a field, you could say the topsoil, the growable black earth full of living beings and nutrition, this, the topsoil of the bodhisattva's mind is feet deep. It's deep. So, samadhis. Now, I'm mixing my metaphors all over the place. We were back into uh, sports car gear shifts, and now we're, now we're talking about dirt that grows crops, right? So I was walking uh, in our, our bushland here in Queensland uh, yesterday and looking at the, 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 the composition of the topsoil, and it's mostly clay. Uh, when, when the leaves fall, 
They're, a lot of them are eucalyptus, gum trees, and they don't, eucalyptus are, a, they're, uh, they have uh, oils and things that doesn't, don't grow crops. So the, the topsoil is, this is not known as a rich agricultural area, right, for that reason. So, and I say, if you, anybody wants a good major for your future academic studies, look into topsoil and civilization, man oh man. They are hand in glove. Where the soil is rich, people thrive. That's where they'll live. Indeed, indeed. So, this bodhisattva can do this amazing thing, which is in a blink of a snap of a bird across the sky, he or she can enter samadhis to the zero, 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 zero numbers. Lots of samadhis. That's a mind well trained. Furthermore, not only that, the 10th stage bodhisattva can also, you see the up to and including there? What does the up to and including mean? That means parts have been left out because they've been said so often. Earlier, back in the first, second, third stage, they were enumerated one by one by one. All the things this bodhisattva can do. Here, it's like, we assume you know what those are, so we're going to say, Naiju, up to and including. We're not going to tell you them all because you can probably recite them in your sleep, right? All the things the bodhisattva can do. Nah. Samadhis and he can make bodhisattvas appear to follow him. What it says. Yeah. Now, um, this is a, an amazing Avatamsaka phenomena. I don't think they talk about this much in the Pali texts, but when, um, here's, here's how, an example of how it works. People know um, chapter 40 of the Avatamsaka, that's called Samantabhadra's Practices and Vows, right? Pushenong Yenpin. It's the end of the Avatamsaka Sutra, the third translation of three out of, the third out of three. And our hero, Sudana, good wealth, good and wealthy, has been traveling to 53 teachers, just wanting to find the truth. The answers to his questions, how do you cultivate bodhisattva practices? How do you walk the bodhisattva path? He goes to 52 and he goes to 51, 51 point, points him to Samantabhadra. And before he gets there, good advisor number one, Manjushri, sticks his hand down, pats the crown of his head, encourages him on, go see your teacher, you've made it, you've done it, you've finished your pilgrimage, good job. Go see Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra answers Sudhana's question, finally. And he answers 10 times, 10 answers. And interestingly, there's boilerplate in that chapter. Each of the answers has a refrain, has a chorus that repeats and repeats. And in that part of that refrain is this interesting phenomenon that Manjushri, uh, Samantabhadra says to Sudhana, he says, okay, because I use Samantabhadra's practices and vows, he says, and the power of my own faith and understanding, I can visualize a Buddha as if he's right in front of me. And I bow to him. That's his first answer. Okay, second answer, he says, because I use Samantabhadra's practices and vows, and the power of my own faith and understanding, I can see many Buddhas right in front of me. And each Buddha is surrounded by a host of bodhisattvas. And what does he do? I praise them all with many voices, many songs and praise, many banjos, many mandolins, many pianos. And then he says, 
Good man. The third method, the third practice, generosity, making offerings. I can visualize as if right before my eyes, because I use Samantabhadra's practice and vows, power in my own faith and understanding, and my past vows, I can see as if before my eyes, many, many, many Buddhas and many, many, many Bodhisattvas, right? So, you get the point. Progressively, as he goes through practices one to 10, he keeps saying that. He says, the Buddhas increase and the Bodhisattvas increase. Really? Well, he says, as if they were right in front of my eyes. I can visualize them. So, Samantabhadra is in, in two realms. He's in an ultimate realm where it is real because of the power of his mind. And he's also in a, the worldly realm. He's here with us. And in that case, he says, it's just a contemplation. So, subtle difference, but that's how the mind does it. Where do your dreams go? Subtle, right? Same. So, okay. In other words, bodhisattvas appear. That's part of the avatamsaka. They're like, what are the, buddies, what are the bodhisattvas doing there? They're checking their phones, for one. They ordering pizza. Are they going through Christmas and the holidays? And are they wearing masks and socially distancing? Probably. Whatever living beings are doing, bodhisattvas are doing as long as it's ahimsa, not harmful. What are the bodhisattvas doing there? They are learning. Because what did we see? Um, I, of all, yeah, this is an interesting point. Of all of the disciples of Master Shrenhua, um, I never heard anybody in Shurfu's presence get away with saying, oh, Shurfu, you're such a bodhisattva. He didn't let us do that. Um, even after his passing, after his nirvana, it doesn't seem right to say, oh, Shurfu was Urstor bodhisattva. Shurfu was Guanyin bodhisattva. Because why? That implies that you know, or that I know I don't. And people who really absorb Master Hua's teaching never make claims of spiritual accomplishment. First of all, if you're a precept holder, that breaks your precepts. But to say it of others doesn't make any difference. Do you know that your teacher was a bodhisattva? Well, in my mind, yeah, but I'm not going to say it for others. Because why? That implies that I know. I don't know. I know I don't know. But when you look at the behavior and you compare what the sutras describe and how our teacher gave us this example, hmm, sure seems that way. Like going last, right? Taking a loss, etc. But my point in saying this was how, what did we see with Master Hua? For sure, for sure, one thing we saw was he loved to learn. Master Hua was a lifelong learner. He was fascinated by the world, the people in it, but just the things too. He just, he had an, a, a curiosity of mind and a love of novelty. And if you wanted to make him happy, uh, the, the best, the thing that I saw Shurfu when he was happiest was when somebody could match one of his couplets with a jue dui, right? An absolute perfect match. He was, he was thrilled. Master Hua was a, a master at matching couplets. Do you know about matching couplets? Dui dui li, it's called. There's this uh, genre of Chinese literature. It is, it is fine literature. Um, where people play word games of, I'll give you a line of characters, okay? 
So I'll give you four, fa, sung, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And I put it down and I'm proud, right? <laughs> Who can match it, right? Somebody goes, he, 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 give me the chalk. Tian di ren, heaven, earth, and humanity. You go, hmm. You know. And that's a jue dui, because each word absolutely matches. There, there's nothing, can't be improved on, right? So Master Hua actually convened one of his best classes at City of 10,000 Buddhas that I attended after my pilgrimage was over was sitting in the Miao Yutang, the, the wonderful words hall, and having Master Hua uh, stand at the blackboard and come in. You could see when he had a good one. He had a really good top line, and he would, he didn't lick the chalk, but just about, you know, okay, write it down, and then stand aside, okay, who's first? And we, the 30 or 40 people in the, in the, in the class, would go, um, oh my God, you know, let me see. We'd grab a chalk, and sometimes there would be, everybody in the class would take their turn on the board. There'd be one top line and then 30 or 40 matching lines, and we would try to match Shifu's top line with, uh, you know, as close as we could get to a perfect match. And then, what would Shifu do? He would go, okay, time's up, all right. He would take his chalk, and he would go to number two, second line, number three, number four, and he would, mm, and then change a word, change two words, say, this makes no sense at all, or encourage somebody, this is pretty good, what do you think about this? And he would go down and all, he would rematch all 30 based on what the person put. And in the process of doing that, we learned about ourselves because Scherf was matching second line. He would match, he would take your match and improve it and in the process teach you about your nature, teach you about the world, teach you about yourself, your name, your wisdom, right? And he would say, matching couplets is such a good method for testing your wisdom, he would say. And he was playing, he was just having tremendous fun. Uh, matching wits, right? So as I say, our teacher was a lifelong learner. Give him uh, a problem and he would delight in solving it and then creatively improving it so that the problem didn't exist in the future, you know. Just that kind of mentality of loving to learn. So my point in telling that story is to say, what are these bodhisattvas doing there? Right? They are following their vows. Here's the 10th stage bodhisattva who is willing to be the mentor, the proctor, right? The good and wise advisor, the Kalyanamitra for a class of bodhisattvas who are on the path but not a 10th stage. And they will follow along in his wake in his train to learn from him so their vows have a hope of being accomplished sometime in the future, right? So that's what those bodhisattvas are doing is they are learners. They are yo shue, they are not jie shue, they're not beyond study, they're still with more to learn, right? So he can make appear as many bodhisattvas as there are fine motes of dust as his following. Okay, so far so good. All right, there we go. Mm. In case you're tired of hearing my voice, blah, 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 blah. Rattling on here. Wanted to show you what happened this week. Here's uh, somebody who showed up this week. Sulfur-crested cockatoo, and of the three or four that bother to come down, they fly over every day, twice, coming out of the Benogan Valley and going back home at night into the forest, Benogan Valley. Mostly they just fly by, but we've had three that have been landing, uh, checking out the, my offering of bird seed. And of the three, there was only one who was willing to eat out of my hand. The other two, as soon as they see me, they go, and fly away. So 
This guy stayed for a picture. He's willing to get a portrait. What else? We had major, major rain, as people know. And here are, oh, not that one. Here are wet lorikeets. Look at them. Huddled together for warmth because it was wet and cold. Rainbow lorikeets. Beautiful colors. And one of our delightful discoveries was Ali the third, Ali, Ali the kookaburra, had a baby, has a son or a daughter, and brought him out to see us. Here's a baby kookaburra. Introduced him to us. This is what you call gormless. This baby knows nothing. He is absolutely helpless without his parents. Feeding him. Just put food in my mouth. Keep me safe. This, you can see his beak is not grown up yet. It, the under beak changes color to white after he's mature. And he loses this fluffiness and his feathers become very smooth and sleek. Here they look like, like fur almost. And he's not a very good flyer. He bangs into branches. <laughs> so his parents are so patient. Look at this, he has these little feet. Barely can hang on with his little feet. This is a baby kookaburra. So we were happy to see him. And saw this guy show up. This is a chocolate wallaby, a swamp wallaby called a chocolate swamp wallaby. And my friend Richard McEwen down in Melbourne said, oh, so you also have chocolate bilbies? Do you have uh, chocolate, uh, you have chocolate possums, right? For Easter, right? Chocolate wallaby. But I like it because he's smiling. This is a smiling wallaby. According to the reports, they're uh, rare in, they are in Stradbrook Island in our corner of southeastern Queensland. Look at this fur. Beautiful color. There we go. All right. More to come. So let's look at the next paragraph of our, oops, that's not what I want. Hit the wrong, there we are, there it is. Okay, we ready? Next chunk of text. Ruo yi pu sa shu sheng yuan li, zi zai shi xian, guo yu zi shu. So wei, ruo xiu xing, ruo zhuang yan, ruo xin jie, Ready? English, here we go. When he applies the sublime strength of a bodhisattva's vows and appears at will, he surpasses that number, namely, be it his cultivation, his adornments, his faith and understanding, be it in his deeds, his bodies, his speech, his radiance, or his faculties, be it his spiritual transformations, his voice, or his places of practice. These aspects could not be enumerated or known even throughout hundreds of thousands of kotis, of nayutas, of eons. So, um, what makes sense here, the key for this passage is knowing that the Bodhisattva can make transformed bodies appear. Hua Shen, otherwise known as Ying Shen, response bodies, responsive bodies. This Bodhisattva can make his form appear as he chooses to teach and he does that with these 
uh, tools in his toolkit with these uh, qualities, with these attributes, with these virtues at his call. What are they? Look at the number. His cultivation is the power, that's the engine that moves him towards his goal of teaching beings. His, that's the inner stuff, kind of his, his uh, fuel store. His adornments are his externals, how he looks, so that you take one look at him and you trust him. You like his voice. You believe the things he says. So you're willing to listen, right? Those are the adornments. Let's say, for example, a a Samuel Jackson kind of voice, right? A deep voice uh, that sounds very knowledgeable, a friendly voice, right? His faith and understanding are his, uh, the depth of his mind behind the things he says. He's able to, for example, you ask him a question and he doesn't go, um, well, I'm, I'm not real sure, but um, I think no, he doesn't. He goes, here's how it is. Why? Because he doesn't talk about things that aren't principle. And the principles, for example, cause and effect, for example, are deep in his mind. We saw Master Hua do that. When, when a situation arose that was ambiguous, we don't know what's the right thing to do, Master Hua would answer in primary colors. Right? For example, red was red. Here's red. Yellow was yellow. That's yellow. Red and yellow are different. Right? It wasn't, oh, it's kind of fuchsia. It's kind of pink. It's a little bit uh, burnt sienna. Mm -mm. Red, green, yellow, blue, and black and white. Not that he couldn't be subtle. Of course he could. Everything was subtle. But... The, when it was right and wrong, question of moral values, you were clear on what Shurfu, where, where Shurfu stood, right? Why? Based on faith and understanding in principle and dharma. No doubt. It works. You can stand on it. It will support you if you take your stand on dharma, right? Okay, next, look at this. Deeds, the Bodhisattva does. His tennis shoes are well worn. He doesn't just talk it. In fact, often he doesn't talk it, he just does it. He doesn't wait. Too many words confuse you. Just do it, right? His body is plural. The bodies that he can make make appear. His speech, the words those bodies say. And then this one is interesting because in a list you know, you think body, mouth, and mind, right? So you think, oh, well, his thoughts. No, uh-uh. his guangming. What do you get out of that? This bodhisattva makes appear bodies with light. Do I see it? Mm, not much. No, not really. But you certainly feel it. The thing about, you know, what, what words do we use? We have words for this. Things like charisma. Things like um, character, integrity, willpower, kind of the force of will, definitely, those are the things. Um, When, you know, all of us, each one of us, have people in our lives whom we followed, for better or for worse, not always for better. Who did we follow? Think about your life. Who did you meet who had that force of personality that you just didn't question? When you, when they said something, that's how it was, right? You know that. And um, certainly great generals of troops, 
of armies can sometimes have that quality. They just, you know, I'm, I will follow you into battle and put my life on the line because I trust, I believe, I agree with you, right? That's, what is it, is it, what is it? It's, maybe it's their light, you think? Um, I remember, I remember being in the uh, federal penitentiary, the federal prison in Hualien, in Taiwan, on the East Coast. We had gone as, uh, at the invitation of one of our laymen who knew the warden, the chief warden at Hualien, Tianyu, this maximum security prison where the, the worst offenders were. And he had this quality. He had an ability to say things that you believed. And it's interesting because his voice was quiet. He would, he had a low pitched, quiet voice. So when he said things, people always did this. They would go immediately, come out of their center of balance and arrogance to because you wanted to know what he said. And I saw these tough, tough life in prison classmates, they were called. He taught us to say classmates, tongshue, not, not prisoners, not qiu fan, you know, not, they're not fan ren. They were classmates. They would be putting on their attitude, you know, and that's how you survive in prison. You're tougher than everyone else. And when Zhang, uh, Dian Yu Zhang, would show up, Mr. Zhang, Warden Zhang, they would wag their tails. They would just, you know, pull down all of their horns and their, just kind of like this. Why? They wanted him to, to include them. They wanted to be in his light. It was light. He had it. He had that ability. And it was goodness. He was tougher than them, but not mean. And, and people just came to him, you know, an amazing quality. And it was light. He didn't, it was not a uniform. He didn't have any weapons. He didn't have anything except force of his cultivation. So the Bodhisattva uses that, Guangming, his radiance, right, to, to teach. Or his faculties. For example, memory. Memory is a faculty, a clarity of his an ability to hold things in mind and bring them forth uh, upon request. I've, uh, in this series, I've uh, shared with you Master Hua's uh, incredible skills of memory. And he memorized texts as a boy, never forgot him. The entire book were, was there at recall, at will. When uh, he was in his 60s, he could bring back texts that he memorized when he was 15. Right? And, oh man, how impressive is that? To have somebody just go and go and go. Another, th another thing, speaking of what I said, what made, what Sherfu enjoyed, what you could see made him happy, Matching couplets made him happy, but occasionally, I think on three or four different occasions, I had the opportunity to see Master Hua sit with a scholar, a classically trained Confucian scholar uh, who had the same background that he did, had the same, uh, was presented with the same classics, the Si Shu and the Wu Jing and the Shi San Jing, the four books of Confucius, the five classics, and the 13 classics. And when they discovered that they both shared the same training, uh, I, I was present when they would play, uh, play games with each other in quoting, loving to bring up quotes. And it wasn't always just the, the classics. Uh, Master Hua really, really, really enjoyed San Guo Yan Yi, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Uh, 
he read that as a kid and just, I won't say memorized it, but boy, he, <laughs> he with, uh, there was one in particular, uh, uh, Yang Xiaozun, uh, Professor Yang, Yang Jingsun was his name, and uh, Shifu gave him a title, called him the revered one of the school, Yang Xiaozun. Uh, Professor Yang was uh, a teacher of Chinese culture and classics in Southern California at the university. And he and Shifu were great buddies. And I was present when they would go into uh, a learned discussion of the romance of the three kingdoms, Sango Yin Yi. And they would say, ah, oh, but Zhuge Liang shouldn't have done that. Yeah, but Cao Cao was evil to be, no, he wasn't. Cao Cao was really quite good. He was a bodhisattva, yeah, but. And then they would come up with stories of how they out, how Cao Cao was clever like a fox and he outwitted uh, Zhuge Liang, the great general, and finally was defeated by him. And, and they were just having the best of times. It was, uh, what do they say? Uh, uh, right? Once it passed your eye, they never forgot it. And, and so Shifu would play, uh, they, they would, you know, go into this uh, samadhi of re, reliving the romance of the three kingdoms. That's a faculty, that ability to do that. Yeah. When you're in the presence of somebody who can recite for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes and not stop, it's impressive. It's impressive. Concert pianists have to, uh, have to memorize not only their part, but a part of the orchestra as well. Right? If you notice, when, uh, when there's a concerto, piano, soloist, the orchestra has the music in front of them. But the cellist, they turn the page, they have the music. The pianist, no music. They have to have it all, all there. They have to know the orchestra's part, but also their own. That's impressive. I, uh, my memory is so poor these days, my own song lyrics I have to have on the <laughs> stand in front of me. I'll forget the third verse. I, uh, that's puny, right? So this Bodhisattva's faculties be it his spiritual transformations, his voice, or his places of practice, if I wanted to tell you all about them, I couldn't enumerate them, put them in numbers, I couldn't even know them, even if I had hundreds of thousands of kotis of nayutas of eons to do so. Why not? Because this is a tenth stage bodhisattva. That's why. More. Move through. Okay. Here we go. Fozi Tsi Pusa Mohasa Shi Di Hung Xiang Tsi Di Xian Qian Tsi Nang Chi Ru Yi Che Zhi Zhi Pi Ru Ano Da Chi Chu Si Da He Chi He Liu Zhu Bian Yan Pu Ti Ji Wu Jin Jie Fu Gang Zeng Zhang Nai Zhi Ru Hai Ling Qi Chong Man We're going to continue on down here. Fu Zi Pu Sa Yi Er Song Pu Ti Xin Liu Chu Shan Gan Da Yuan Zhi Shui Yi Se She Fa Chong Man Zhong Shang Wu Yau Chong Jin Fu Gang Zeng Zhang Nai Zhi Ru Yu Yi Che Zhi Hai Ling Chi Chong Man. Okay, we have a, a rich analogy here. Ready? Disciples of the Buddha, when the attributes of the ten stages practices appear before this Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, in sequential order, then he can approach mastery of the wisdom of wisdoms. This is similar to Lake Anabatapta, the source of four massive rivers. As these rivers flow forth to fill up Jambudvipa, they never run dry, but instead keep increasing until they enter the ocean and keeping it full. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, is this way as well. From his initial resolve for Bodhi, 
He brings forth the waters of wholesome qualities and vast vows and uses the four dharmas of attraction to fill sentient beings endlessly. The waters keep increasing until it enters the ocean of omniscience, keeping it full. I mixed up my plural there. The water keeps increasing. Okay, we have an analogy. It says what? It says, when the attributes of the ten stages practices appear before the bodhisattva. Okay, this is a little bit of a mystery here. Um, there's something, because I don't know how this works, and I haven't heard it discussed either, but there's something about the cultivation of the ten stages and the cultivation of the avatamsaka dharma that when you master it, it comes from inside because it's already there and you've now uncovered it. This says the attributes of the practices appear before the bodhisattva. What does that mean? It means that he or she has now removed the ignorance that covered him over in this deep and subtle place. So now these qualities are his or hers by birth right. And they appear in sequential order. They're already there, but they have to be uncovered at, with a definite technique that allows them to come forth. And that is a sign, Buddha, give me a sign, that the wisdom of wisdoms, each ajurjur, this stage of Buddha's wisdom is about to appear, but not quite, right? So, what do they say? They say, one who knows, knows, one who knows. How do you know when you're a 10-stage bodhisattva? Ask a 10-stage bodhisattva because they know. Nobody else does. Right? The, is it a secret mark? Is it a handshake? Is it a pin on your lapel? No. It's a light. It's a quality. It's a state of being that those who are already there can recognize. And it comes out of you once it's been trained. Interesting, huh? So I say a little bit mysterious here because people don't talk about it unless they've realized this state. So, okay, P.U. What's it like? It's like Lake Anabatapta. A o do lo he hu, right? Chi, they call it a chi. What is Lake Anabatapta? Oh boy. It says here, the source of four massive rivers, and the rivers flow out, fill up Jambudvipa, Jambudvipa, they never dry out, they keep increasing until they get to the ocean. Some new information here. So Lake Anavatapta is a Buddhist geography lake. If we go looking for Lake Anavatapta, uh, some people said it's Lake Manasarovar, Maybe, something like it, but the same way that Mount Sumeru, Sumeru is invisible to the ordinary discriminating eye, likewise, Lake Anabatapta is also invisible to our discriminating vision, but it's not entirely, because why? The Ganges River comes out of it. The Indus River comes out of it. The uh, Arudana comes out of it, and let's see, there's, there are four great rivers that actually appear on our maps, but the lake itself is not there until you wake up with your eyes open. You say, oh, it's been there all along. What is Lake Anabatapta? It's Wu Wu Ru Nao. Right? It's the lake without any heated afflictions. So it's the lake without troubles. It's the no blues lake. Now you don't have any. 
没有了，无热闹河。So it's not a 河 ，it's a 湖 or a 池。It's a lake where all of your worries and troubles go away. It's a healing lake. Let me show you. Here it is. Are we ready? Nope, not there. Try this one. A. Did I not? Let's see here. One moment, please. Okay. Well, it's one of those moments when you reach for the material you prepared and it's not there. Okay. Um, Lake Anavatapta. I'll do it from memory. So Lake Anavatapta looks like this. Here is a Buddhist monk's map of the world. Here's India. Here's Japan. Here's Taiwan.、Uh, this is a 17th century monk. This is Lake Anavatapta right there. Wu Ru Nao He, and you can see the An O Da Chi. Okay, on the top there. Here is a dragon. There is a dragon named On the top there. Is one of the ten great dragon kings, Shi Da Long Wang. There he is, and you can see he is the source of this healing water. So Anavatapta is the name of a dragon and the name of this great lake, and the waters of the lake put out four rivers, according to our map here. The Hin, the Hindu, the the Hindu, Hin, the Indus River, the Ganges River.、Um, I think it's the Mekong actually, but it's got a different name, and then the Tamir River. The last one, the Mekong River goes through Vietnam and through Cambodia. There, it's a major source. Now, one of the issues that we will not be talking about today is that with climate change, these rivers are now changed seriously. Threatened their future, and the glaciers that feed them. Up high, this Lake Anavatapta is in the Himalayas. They say, and it. Oh, guess what? Here we are. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. By golly. It's in the center of the world, the world being Jambudvipa. It is free from affliction, Wu Ru Nao, and the waters were healing. They could put out all of your greed, put out your anger, put out your delusion, and the dragon who lives there became a bodhisattva. He doesn't have the heat and itching. They say that plagues all the other dragons, the other nine. Plus the Da Peng Jin Chi Niao, the Garudas eat dragons. Well, they don't eat on the top of the dragon. I said ten. There are eight. Eight dragon kings, right? 我说错了，不是十个大。There's 八大龙王 On the top, the is one of them. They say that it's a sacred Himalayan lake that can cure human sins. They wash away your deepest afflictions, and the waters come out of gargoyles with animals' heads. It's said to be at the foot of Mount Kailash, which is a magical mountain.、Um, Ajahn Sumedho, one of our Dharma friends, did the Mount Kailash pilgrimage and nearly died. This is a Mount Kailash is really there in the Himalayas, and Buddhist faithful every year circumambulate it, and many die. 
But they say if you die in the search of circling Mount Kailash, going around it, circumambulating, your soul goes directly to one of the Buddhist heavens. So, okay. Uh, what are the, la the rivers that I mentioned? The Ganges, the Indus, the Amudarya, and then the Huanghe. The Tarim is number four. So, the Ganges is a real river on the east side, but it's also a mythical river, a Buddhist river. The Indus is a real river in the south, but it's also one of the Buddhist sacred rivers. Amudarya, to the west, is both real and not there, and the Tarim and the Huanghe, likewise, okay? So notice that's confusing and contradictory, because why? Well, it's yes and no. They're really there. If you open your eyes, you realize they never were not there. But if you can't see with that kind of vision, then it's as if they didn't exist. You have to take it on the Buddha's word. Got it. Okay, what else did we hear? Notice what it said, that the waters of Lake Anabatapta flow down and the four rivers never go dry. Likewise, the 10th stage Bodhisattva from his Chu Fa Putishin, from his first resolve for Bodhi, brings forth the waters of Shan Gun and Da Yuan. Liu Chu Shan Gun Da Yuan Zhi Shui. The water of wholesome qualities and vast boughs. Furthermore, this is the point that I want to make. This Bodhisattva uses the four dharmas of attraction to endlessly fill living beings. The water keeps increasing until they become Buddhas, keeping it full. What are the four dharmas of attraction? I just showed you. Se, she, fa, they're called. Here they are. You ready? Oh, did I close it? Didn't want to close it. Come back here, please. Ten stage notes. There we are. Se, she, fa, right here. Here they are. Four methods of gathering living beings together. Four methods of getting people to listen to you until they believe in the Dharma you speak, they desire to imitate you and to try it out, they start to cultivate. This is a Mahayana Bodhisattva's tool bag, right? This is, these are what if you don't shu, shu shou, zhong shang, gather living beings in, there's nobody to teach. How can you possibly carry out your vows, right? So what are they? Bodhisattvas give. They are generous. Furthermore, they use kind words, gentle speech. Furthermore, they'll work with you. Furthermore, they help. They volunteer. They serve. We could actually use ad volunteer. They volunteer. This is what bodhisattvas do. And I like this because why? People think that Buddhists are just under the tree seeking nirvana, never mind you, right? Never mind, they're not. That's not the, the Mahayana. If bodhisattvas didn't use these four methods to get people close to them, they would be all alone. Their vows would never come true. But what does it say? Again, our bodhisattva had the water of wholesome qualities and good vast vows to keep living beings full of fa shi, the joy of dharma, right? Giving, kind words, cooperation, service. I really like this list. And when I think about our teacher, right? 
when you have like okay so we have our grand teacher master empty cloud Xu Yun Lao Ha Shang I was just reading one of his incredible encounters the word was and again people don't make this claim so much but when you they do once master empty cloud is passed on at age 120 you can kind of talk more about him after he's gone right but even so he was said to be an eighth stage bodhisattva not a tenth stage but an eighth stage bodhisattva and there are signs and yet he still used absolutely these four methods to do what he wanted to do the teaching he wanted to do the story goes he was staying in a home in a pretty much a lawless part of China back in a time when there was lots of bandits lots of gangs little, you know bandit gangs um, riding along through the countryside of China uh, robbing and stealing and killing and doing what they wanted. So in the situation like that, sometimes the monks would attach themselves to a family. The family in a compound, think a walled fortress, would set up a Dharma hall and invite a monk to come. And because Master Empty Cloud had an affinity with this family, he agreed to stay with them on the condition that they gave up their killing and eat, killing of animals and eating of meat. And so the, uh, the whole family had to agree, and the workers, any of their farmhands, had to also agree. So in the process, they negotiated and said, well, what do we do with we, we ourselves won't eat meat but we can't ask everyone to eat meat some people have to and also we have these animals that are only here you know they're they're meant to die and so what do we do so master empty cloud said okay these animals perhaps with their karma they have to die for the last meat eaters but after these no more, or else I won't stay. They said, okay. So on this day that the story is told, right, um, there were cows that were destined to be slaughtered for the last, just because they didn't belong to the family, but they were borrowed. They were sort of, what do you say, commissioned. So they were going to feed the last, last meat eaters the last meal. And so one of the cows jumped over the fence, separating the stables and the pad, the, uh, the pasture from where the monks were, where Master Empty Cloud was, came running over to Master Empty Cloud, who was sitting in meditation outside, and knelt in front of him with tears running down the cow's face. And people saw this, and they really, really saw it. And they were all like, oh, you know, and what are we going to do? What, what is this? What's going on? And so people were listening very carefully to the words that Master Empty Cloud said. So what did he say? He said, they're there. He said, your karma's really heavy. He said, I will give you the refuges now but you owe your life. I'll make you my disciple. You go back and undergo the retribution that you have to undergo. I will bring your soul back and you'll be happily reborn and you won't have to do this anymore. Are you willing? And the cow is like, nods. So, Master Empty Cloud, gave the three refuges, refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, to this, this being in a cow's body. The cow went back, was slaughtered, and then <coughs> Shri Yin Lao Ho Shang, Master Empty Cloud, said, 
happily reborn, better this time. So imagine this kind of kind words and gentle speech and the light, right, of, of this teacher so that even a cow sees here is refuge, here is safety, and in a future life, willing to undergo switching bodies in order to give up the, the to get through the karma that is owed and into a better rebirth. What kind of deep faith does that require, right? Four methods of gathering in living beings. They say, true story. Now, I don't live on a farm, so I don't, I don't, deal with large-bodied domestic animals, right? But people who were there say, absolutely, that's what happened. Pretty amazing, right? So that, if you're an eight-stage bodhisattva, you can give at that level. And beings will believe you at that level. Yeah, yeah. I have another one. And this one is actually a video and the video has to do with a kind of giving. Uh, here we are. We have, I have, uh, the videos that I savor all have to do with delivery people from America. Are you ready for a story of giving? Here we go. Optimize for video clip. All right, here we go. FedEx driver. I'm here, we spend a lot of time and money trying to find the right gifts for people. But in a tiny Indiana community, one boy got the perfect gift. One he wasn't even expecting came from a complete stranger. Brad Underwood has that story. As the saying goes, in 49 states, it's just basketball. But this is Indiana. It's hard to explain how much I love it. It's like really my passion. Elijah Maines loves basketball so much, it doesn't matter that his hoop was rusty with the bent rim. The shots keep coming. He's been doing this since he was a baby. He absolutely loves it. The key words are, was rusty. Elijah's mom, Kalito Wheeler, came home to an unexpected delivery on her front porch recently, waiting to be found. A brand new Spalding basketball, an instruction manual for a basketball hoop, and a note on a FedEx ticket. Just wanted you and your son to have the best hoop that will grow with him and all of his friends. It's wonderful to see you guys shoot hoops with him. I started to cry. I mean, that was my first reaction because it was such a random act of kindness that is so hard to find right now with everything going on. On the manual, another note signed, Take care, Aubrey. Just one of your FedEx drivers for the area. A couple of days later, Aubrey came back with sandbags to secure the post. Honestly, like, really thankful. Like, I love it. I like playing on it. Like, I'll ask at night to go out and shoot on it. Wheeler posted about the random act of kindness on Facebook. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, it's been shared quite a few times. And the day before Thanksgiving, Aubrey came back again. She and Elijah played ball this time. As for who won? Uh, we all won, technically. Certainly, a feeling mom has too. It's been really hard on everybody this year. So for her to do that, I was in wow and I was in awe. I was almost kind of speechless at first. In Franklin County, Indiana, Brad Underwood, Local 12 News. There's okay. nothing better he could have gotten. I know. I, and this time of the year when you see those stories like that, yeah. with those random acts of kindness, and it, it just completely made his day, made his world. My you know? FedEx driver's really nice to the dogs. Yeah? <laughs> Great. So there you go. That's uh, the kind of giving, right, that we can do. Hold on here. Uh, it's a method of gathering in. They talk about the four methods of gathering in living beings, si fa. And I was touched by that. I noticed that Aubrey, the uh, driver, did not want her image to be captured. She didn't want her face. She, it was really an anonymous donor. But she came back and she played basketball with the little boy, with Elijah, 11 years old. And she also came back with sandbags to keep the, the basketball hoop stable. 
So there we go. That's uh, the spirit of the holidays. And a bodhisattva at the tenth stage has been giving of himself or herself every lifetime, so many times, over and over, to get to that place where they say his shangan and his dayan, his wholesome qualities of his character or her character and the vows that, so the, the qualities, the shangan are the power source, the gas tank, full, full gas tank. The yuanli, the vows, are where that vehicle is going. That's the vows are what carry it down the road. The wholesome qualities are the fuel that keeps the, the bodhisattva vehicle running, right? So, how beautiful is that? And I wanted to, uh, to suggest that people go to, if you want to, if you want to find out more stories like that, many of us are at home now uh, because the virus is like a wolf outside the door, right? Go to coronavirus.com. Org. Karuna is compassion. Like metta is kindness, karuna is compassion. Go to www.coronavirus.org. I'll do that. I'm going to make sure I've got the right address here for you. That will give you access to all these amazing, amazing stories. And the uh, coronavirus is also a website. Oh, one more time. It's also a newsletter that comes out. There it is. Yeah, coronavirus.org. Go, go find this and get your Kleenex box ready because this is a, a website of volunteers who tour through the internet to find the best stories of random acts of kindness. Helen Keller, although the world is full of suffering, it's also full of the overcoming of suffering. The first and second noble truths. Her second and third noble truth, one of a kind shelter helps traumatized dogs learn to trust humans again. Five heartwarming things that made South Africans smile. Cancer ward staff, Let's see, EU bans plastic waste from being shipped to developing countries. Inspired by faith, the skipping Sikh Santa spreads Christmas cheer with a turban. All right. So there, check out coronavirus, definitely. All right. Uh, our time is up for today. I would like to ask uh, Jin Chuan or Jin Wei Shi, whoever's there, to... Uh, Tell us about our newsletter. Sure, uh, Dharma Master. Maybe it's easier if you just go to the birthdaymonastery.org website. Okay. It has all our events on it. There it is. Okay. Well, you'll see that there's three talks given by Reverend Shur beginning tomorrow, December 27th, 30th, and January 2nd. This is for the Amitabha session at CTB from December 27th to January 2nd. So you'll see all those Zoom links there. And the next, actually, that's important to note, next week, Dharma Master, the lecture is going to be on the Pure Land, not on the, I don't know, will you be doing any of the Avatamsaka? Oh, second? okay. So yeah, so what we had in mind, I wanted to tell my staff team here, my group, um, Next Sunday, uh, I was planning these three lectures with our master Jin Yong at CTDB. They're doing their, here at Gold Coast, we just finished our Amitabha session. CTDB begins it, right? So next Sunday, this lecture, next Saturday for America, I would like to, um, the topic is mountains, 10 mountains uh, of our 10th ten, ten stage. I was going to integrate that into Xin Yuan Xing, the third of three lectures. So my Avatamsaka lecture here will be uh, 
connected to City of 10,000 Buddhas last uh, Amitabha session, and I'm going to bring the two topics together. So next week I'll be talking both about the 10th stage and Pure Land, Amitabha. So practices, Xing, right? <coughs> in, the, in the Pure Land tradition, they talk about faith, vows, and practice. And my first lecture tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon here, is going to be faith, visualizing the Pure Land. Then vows, decisive resolve, will be Wednesday. And then next Sunday, we'll talk about practice and the 10th stage. So that's the idea. Okay, Jin Chuan. Yeah. You want Could you also click that schedule button up, up above? The, uh, there's a, after December 27th, January 2nd, 2021, there's a schedule in parentheses. Let's see here. Okay, right. That's yeah, pretty small. Maybe, yeah, maybe I can make that bigger. Um, but that gives you the CDDB schedule if people want to join. And if you go to the bottom, there's the Zoom link, which is the same as the other one we had. So okay. if you want to join the session, you can do that. Okay. At CTDB, right. You can yeah. recite along with the, it's, it's still on Zoom, mind you, but uh, you can get into City of 10,000 Buddhas Buddha Hall, 10,000 Buddhas Hall, and, and uh, join in with, a, there'll be a large group online. Okay, and then you go back. Um, okay, hold on here. Go, you just keep scrolling down. So we have tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m., uh, the dedication of merit for the with the great compassion mantra. People have been continually reciting uh, mantras since the pandemic began, and so we've been supporting everyone once a month. Once a month, the last Sunday of the month, and so that will be tomorrow morning at six thirty to seven thirty. And then we go down one more. We have a retreat. Uh, Dharma Master Jingwei and myself will be doing a retreat on the four boundless hearts, those the Brahma Viharas. The video is a fun video. People haven't don't know about that, but there's been a lot of work on the the oral history project and putting the clips together of interviews. And this little interview is a uh, Master Hua talk teaching, I think, Rav Hongshu and Marty about what secret Dharma to protect themselves. And the four boundless hearts is the is the secret Dharma. <laughs> Uh, keep going down. Uh, Ramon Shur has been lecturing on the interfaith and intrafaith. Uh, Master Hua's teachings on interfaith and intrafaith. Um, this is the Friday 12.30 to 1.30 talk. Um, so if you're interested, um, you can email. It's a little bit strange, but sixpatriarchsutra at gmail.com. That's because the lecture series actually began with the Six Patriarch Sutra. So if you email that, you will find, uh, they will send you a link. With the, with the Zoom uh, information. Yeah, those are the pictures. Um, so this one is coming up later, mid-January. Um, Stephen Tanner will be teaching on the six perfections. And I also believe Reverend, um, Marty, Dr. Martin Verhoeven will be getting his Friday lectures on February 5th next year. So those, oh, also we have the new album of Buddhist songs. This was, I think, launched a couple of months ago but if people wished you can do an act of kindness like what we saw on the um, video there and then write in and get a get the Buddha, the music album all righty good so that's um, it you, any, any more announcements yeah yeah it was i don't know if you want to announce but um i got a, a message that emi oi will be having a concert very soon and okay yeah give me the details on that okay. so if you go to i i i m m music.com you'll see yes this is also important i i got the same message but it was during lecture so i couldn't grab my phone here we are so I, uh, I m no no i m m i oh, so three m. m's i m m m really <laughs> for sure i m m m m and dot. music and music so I M M and then music. Yeah, there you go. I'm in music. There we go. Um, that's that's Amy's website. Yeah, right. Here you go. that you'll see. Okay, the, the concert is starting very soon. Sad to say, it's four thirty a.m. here at in America in California, but in Malaysia time, it's more doable. Eight thirty p.m. in Malaysia time. Okay, this is uh, Amy Oi Huang Huiyin. She is uh, our premier. Buddhist composer, performer, and 
cultivator of music, uh, classically trained, but uh, with a sensibility of Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana. She is bringing to be tonight uh, here at 8.30. 10.30 for you, a Gold Coast. 10.30, 10.30 in the Gold Coast. Um, this incredible concert that sh the last one that she did, the streaming concert, was a few months ago, and they had tens of thousands of people join in, much to everyone's surprise and delight. And her Vajra, uh, the, the Jing Shi Jin Gang, are her, her, core, her band, her, her singers who come with her. And this will be tonight. So it's early in the morning um, in the U.S., but I, you know, if there's anything worth getting up for, this is one. Um, she has guests uh, joining her tonight. Here's her team, her band, and uh, there are there are special guests in her uh, in the concert tonight. It's free. It's on Facebook and YouTube. So please make note of that. That's going to be special. Our Australian friends is tonight at 10:30. Glad you reminded me about that. Yeah. Okay. Shall we transfer the merit and see you all next week happily? Let's see. This is. I'm looking for. Medicine Buddha mantra. To bring it up this way. Let's see here. There it is. Now, the thing about this, ordinarily we would be transferring merit, may every living being, but because of the pandemic, um, we want to do a bit to put out some of Medicine Buddha's energy, some of his spiritual medicine to chase the pandemic and to bring light to people's hearts who are suffering so much from this affliction. And by the way, before we do that, uh, there are 152 folks on YouTube, 32 yeah, listening on the Vietnamese channel, and 78 in the Chinese channel. Awesome. Great. Let's put our hearts into the Vaiduria light. Quells calamities and lengthens life. Medicine Master Buddha. Here we go. Make a wish. Sanjay 
Sanjay, Bhai Sanjay, Bhai Sanjay. Sangudate Swaha. Chase that virus back to where it came from, which is nowhere. Okay, we will now bow three times to the Buddhas. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Be safe, be well, be healthy. Omitopo. See you all next week, everyone. Bye-bye.